Thank you for listening to the Higher Calling Podcast. I'm your host, Pete Newsom, and this is your source for all things hiring, staffing, and recruiting. I'm excited to be joined today by two people who I've worked with for a long time and I'm very honored to have on the show today, Rich Simmons and Tony Alvarez. Both are IT executives with Holiday Inn Club Vacations. Rich is the Vice President of Technology Innovations, and Tony is Vice President of Next Generational Development. So Rich and Tony, welcome. How are you guys today? Fantastic, Pete. How are you? I'm really good. Good. Now, I, I have very long bios on both of you guys that I feel somewhat silly trying to read from because I know you personally so well. So rather than do that, if you wouldn't mind just briefly introducing yourselves a little bit further so everyone knows who you are. Sure, Pete. It's easy to have a long bio whenever you're the old guy in the room, right? So uh, I've been around the business for quite some time, but my name is Rich Simmons. I am the Vice President of Technology Innovations for Holiday and Club Vacations. And in that role, basically what it means is I pretty much run anything inside of IT from any sort of technical innovations that we do through operational efficiencies and business transformation. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. And what I do with uh, next generation uh, development is really go out there and look for that cutting or bleeding edge technology and see how it can apply to our business. And one of the things that you know, Rich being a mentor of mine has encouraged me to do is look outside of the industry, look beyond the industry that I'm in and look elsewhere to see how we can bring those kind of technologies in and, and, you know, advance our business and our business processes. Awesome. Well, great. And let's, um, let's just get right into the real reason I wanted you guys on today, which is perhaps a bit of a surprise, but maybe not since, this is something in nearly every conversation we've had going back, Rich, I think we've known each other, you know, 17 years now, something yeah, along those yeah. lines. And as, as we've gotten to know each other better, there's, it's so clear that you take leadership, culture, and team building seriously in a way that no one else I know does. And, and, and I, and I say that I probably should run through a list of everyone I know to make sure that claim is accurate. But certainly at a level that's rare, it's something that gets a lot of lip service, but you're one of those few people who live and breathe it every day. And as I've gotten to know Tony over the years, you have uh, shared that mentality with Tony. Maybe he brought it uh, you know, to the party himself and, and you fed off each other, but it's a really rare thing that I think others could benefit by learning more about. So I wanna talk about that today. Is that, is that fair game? Absolutely, totally fair game. So maybe start with something that I know of, but quite frankly, very little about, and that's RLF, which is a regional leadership forum, I believe, who you both uh, have invested a lot of time and effort into. And if, from my impression, it has been one of, if not the most impactful things that you've done in your professional life. So if you guys wouldn't mind just explaining what RLF is and why it's made such a difference in your lives. Yeah, Pete, I'll, I'll take that one first, Tony, but um, RLF, or Regional Leadership Forum, is actually a program put on by the Society of Information Management, which is a nationwide group of senior IT professionals. Um, the funny thing about it is, is that it really has very little to do with IT in general, other than the participants, participants being mostly from IT. But at the foundation, RLF is really about kind of breaking down who you are, why you are who you are, and then really helping you define the value behind that, that person that you ultimately want to become. And I think, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a very intense program. It's labeled as a leadership course, but the reality is I would consider it to be more of a, a personal course it, because it really does focus so much on who you are as a human and then the value behind that. And it's about a seven-month program in which you meet two days a month over the seven-month period. And in that seven months, you, you have guest speakers that'll come in, all of you have typically very senior stature from different industries. Um, you'll have anybody from, you know, I think one of the very first speakers I met was the very first CIO of the FBI. His name is Darwin John, fantastic gentleman. Uh, so the quality that, that you get and the experience you get that, that from the people that come to speak to you is fantastic. But outside of that, you're doing so many things from a, from a personal standpoint. You'll read about 30 books throughout those seven months. And in that, in that seven months of those book readings, you're also doing book reports and things of that nature. And I think the very interesting thing about it is for me personally, is that you're in a room with about 20 people, all of about the same seniority and mindset as you. But as they're doing their book reports, 
you're listening to this and you just read this book and you're listening to them speak about it. And you're going like, wait a second, but I, I don't think we're talking about the same book. And then they'll say something. You're like, wait, no, I, that part sounds familiar. And what it really starts to make you do is to look at yourself and say, I did not get what they got out of that book. Why not? This is somebody of about the same background as me, the same maturity level as me, yet the, how they interpreted the same words that I read were greatly different. So it really starts to make you wonder, what is it that you're missing? Why did you not see things the same way? And it starts to challenge your own beliefs. Beyond that, you do a lot of personalized exercises and things of that nature, and it goes over family history and just career upbringing and key moments in your life. And Myself, I've had several key moments in my life, and you've heard my conversation more than once. So, uh, you know, it, it really helps you define, again, who you are as a person. That's that's great feedback. And, you know, I want to uh, dive into a couple of those things uh, in just a minute. But, Tony, uh, what, what would you add to complement that? Well, it's it's one of those things where you, you really try to put your finger on on what it does and how it gets you. And, and there's no real way to explain that RLF experience. But the cool thing about it is, and something uh, we've almost coined as RLF graduates, is you, somewhere along the way, you get that RLF, RLF moment, moment where it just hits you. It, it just hits you like a ton of bricks, and, and it, it can be quite emotional. And, and I think what it truly does is it allows you to get in touch with your, your you know, I don't want to use taglines or key phrases, but in, in a context like this, you can't help but to, but you have the, that, that moment where you figure out who your true authentic self is. And once you dig down deep like that and figure that out, the rest is gravy. You just, you, your, your life, uh, your life at work, uh, the way you lead others, it, it just becomes second nature. Now I will admit some of the things you learn along the way, it's like a muscle. You need to work it out a little bit. But once you get going and you get cooking and you get in touch who, with who you are authentically, um, everything else becomes easy at that point. And, and for me, that's what the experience was about because I entered that experience, Rich will tell you, uh, a very insecure leader, a very insecure person. I just didn't even feel like I belonged there. And, uh, you know, if you saw me walking in there, Pete, I was like peeking around the corner and kind of <laughs> inching my way in and inching my way out. And, That's not the Tony I know for the record. <laughs> oh, I, I promise you. It was, it was very, very um, an overwhelming experience in all the positive ways that it could be. So while, while Rich outlined some of the structure of it, you know, reading books and, and doing some reports on these books to really polish your, your public speaking and your ability to to hone in on, on what your opinions are and how to uh, get that word out into a public forum. It's really more of the emotional journey for me that you go on, which, which uh, uh, just makes a difference in figuring out who you are as a person. And once you've really established that, leading just becomes second nature. Yeah, and I'll, I'll say too, I think to maybe even piggyback a little further on what Tony said, you gotta remember that there's 20 something people in these courses that are all going through that same emotional journey at the same time. So the right. bonds that you form there, it really is like a fraternity or, or brotherhood that, you know, you don't get many other places. And in many cases, these people will know you better than your, your friends and family and neighbors will know you. And it's, uh, it, it's a very interesting perspective. It's a lot yeah. of time to commit, you know, two days a month for seven months. You know, you could say it and it doesn't sound like a lot, but I, I get anxiety just hearing that, the thought of making that kind of commitment and then having to stick with it. So you probably are spending more concentrated, focused time with those people than you do anyone else. I mean, even even the people you're closest to in your life, you don't spend that kind of dedicated yeah. time to them. It's beyond the actual sessions. It's a little bit beyond that because, in, you know, in the in-between time, you know, you're working on those speeches. You're working on those assignments and you're working in a collaborative way with the other people that are attending with you, you know, so you build those connections and you build those ties. And uh, to this day, you know, uh, the people that I graduated with are, are still in contact with me. I'm in contact with them. Like, like Rich said, it's like a fraternity and we, uh, we keep tight, you know, it's great contacts to have, if anything. That's yeah, neat. I'll tell you, Pete, you know, you're, you're not wrong. It is a commitment, right? But the reality is, is, is there a better person to be committed to than yourself when it comes to your own growth and your own value? Right. 
You no, probably learned that there, didn't you? Because I, I don't, I, I have no comeback to that. There you go. <laughs> well, there's a reason that when you're on the airplane, right, it always tells you to put your own mask on before you help anyone else, right? If you're not the best that you can be, you're never going to be the best for anybody else. Oh, but man, that that's a great line. And, um, you know, it's, but it's, it's easier said than done, right? To yeah. focus on yourself because it takes, a, a commitment and a dedication that most of us don't think we have time to give. And, you know, that seems a little backwards as I say it out loud, because, you know, for a little bit of sacrifice of time now, you're probably going to be better um, you know, in the future. And that's the ultimate goal, right? Ultimately. Yes. So about the aha moments, can you, can you share what led to those for, for you individually, or is that too personal? We, we it, probably could. It, it is very personal, you know, and and uh, it, it, it takes you on a journey uh, that, um, you, you know, you discover things about your past and how they've affected you, your family and all those things. And, uh, you know, I think it all it, it hits you in certain times and in, and in certain points where you don't expect it. And for me was reliving the journey of my background to get to where I am and and certainly to where I am today, which even going past my RLF graduation, there there were a ton of crucibles that I've gone through and a, uh, a ton of things that have um, evolved even who I am after I graduated. But for me, it's figuring out that um, it doesn't matter what your journey is and what your history is and what your past is, you're just as worthy and you belong just as much. And that hit me pretty hard and it hit me with a great deal of emotion because, you know, um, walking in there, I didn't think I belonged there and I didn't think I belonged with everybody that was in that uh, forum. But when it hit me, the amount of, of caring that the people around me had and the amount of worth that I was and what I was able to contribute and uh, how, how far I've come, Pete. I mean, uh, you're talking to a person that didn't even graduate from high school that didn't even graduate from college, that at that point didn't have a degree to his name in anything. And um, I have been able to work hard and evolve to, to who I am today. And you know, here's the thing, you don't do it by yourself. I mean, I've had mentors like Rich and, and a ton of people along the way that's given me a leg up and that have opened the doors for me and helped me out. And when you realize all that, those things, all of a sudden that becomes your aha moment. And you're like, wait a second, I do belong here. You know, I am worthwhile. And, it, and then the emotions just start rushing in. It's, um, it's, it sounds very deep. And that's a little scary too uh, for me because I, I don't know that I want to have to be that um, introspective. Vulnerable. I think <laughs> vulnerable, yeah. right? I mean, yeah. Yeah, that, that's its own powerful um Thing, right, we could talk for hours, in, if not days, about vulnerability. It's something that I think about a lot. It's it's something that I think some people are naturally inclined to be, uh, of which I'm one, and 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 others. And I think that's a, a thing that I'm very thankful for naturally because I think it's made me an effective salesperson over the over the years. But I um, don't necessarily want to dig into where it came from. <laughs> so I'm not sure I want to do that. But but if I think of Rich, pre RLF and post, Rich did not lack confidence prior to that. If anything, the Rich I knew on the other side, or I know on the other side, is a kinder, gentler version of the guy going in. So, is it fair to say you have, you know, depending on who you are and what you're about going in, you're going to have a different experience coming out? Yeah, I, I think, you know, when you really start looking at self-awareness, Pete, what you got to understand is the thing that gets in most people's way of them ever reaching their, you know, their hopes and goals and dreams is paradoxically themselves, right? And a lot of times you don't even understand how you're doing it because you lack that self-awareness. And so I think for me personally, it wasn't that I didn't have the confidence. I was very successful in my own business and things of that nature, but the motivation behind what was driving me was actually founded on a lot of childhood traumas. And what I came out of that program with was the, with the, was an understanding as simply as doesn't matter what got me here, who do I want to be going forward? And Tony mentioned being your authentic self, right? It's not that I wasn't in some aspects my authentic self. I'm not sure I actually knew who I was or who I actually wanted to be until I finalized that program. 
what I was doing by by all by all you know indications was very successful. I had a very successful company, big house, fancy cars, nice clothes, all of those things. But I was I still felt in many ways that I was a I was an imposter. And it wasn't until after I came out of that that I I, I was very comfortable with who I was and who I wanted to be. So to your point, that probably made me a much calmer, more thoughtful leader because I was just simply okay being who I was. It's an expensive program. It's a big time commitment that you know, most aren't able to give or, or you know, your company, if you have an employer, has to be very committed to you in order to allow that to happen, let alone subsidize it or pay for it entirely. So I assume you're surrounded by a lot of people who've already reached a pretty high level of achievement and professional success. It's interesting to hear you guys share that confidence and you know was something that you lacked. I, do you think that that was true for most who were there? Because that's an it's an interesting thing because we assume that those who are successful and have reason to be confident are right. Um, but I, I but think it's a mixed not. bag, Pete. I, I think when you're there, it's a mixed bag, and and you know, a variety of reasons for people to be there and what they want to get out of it. But it really just goes down into the core and it really goes down into one fundamental truth. And that's who, who are you? Who are you really? Who are you on the inside? And how can you hone in on that and, and uh, use it uh, for your future, for uh, future leadership, you know, for uh, your personal life? Because uh, all of this is, is quite personal. It, it's incredibly personal. Um, and for me, you know, I'm, I, I, in my upbringing, I was in the entertainment industry very early on in my life as a young person. And so you have to have a whole level, a whole different level of confidence to get on stage and do some of the things you do in music. And it's funny how you can be extremely confident in some things in your life and just completely lack confidence in other things. And as I ventured through the corporate world, you know, very much like Rich, I, I kind of had that imposter syndrome where like, man, do I really need to be here? Do I belong here? You know? And, um, but I think it all comes down, no matter who's there for what, it comes down to one fundamental truth. And it's a very personal thing. And it's who exactly are you? And what do you have to contribute to the world and other people? Why should anyone listen to you? Why should anyone follow you? And that's where it lands. Very interesting. So I'm going to ask both of you now put you on the spot to ask if you'd come on individually uh, with my other podcast, which is really um, to focus on uh, career enlightenment, how that, how that is achieved, you know, where you start, where you go, because everything, a lot of what you guys are saying right now, I think would apply. And I, and I know uh, about Rich's history and I think there's a lot to share there. Um, and Tony, now that you mentioned being on stage, I, I, there's something that I really want to dig into there. <laughs> so can, will you guys commit to, to doing that then? Oh, absolutely. But I'll tell you right now, Tony keeps talking about this. He's probably going to have more, uh, more record sales than when he was actually on stage for real. <laughs> well, now that I know that I'm, I'm even more intrigued if there's, if there's singing involved. So, um, yeah, no, I, de I would definitely be loved to. I'd be happy to. So, I, but I do want to ask one more question, and then and then you know, move on a little bit. Is that Tony? When you mentioned not going to um, not going to college, something that I uh, think about and talk about a lot these days is is I'm creating career advice and, and content. And I'm someone who believes that in many respects, college is unnecessary. It's overrated. I think our education system is inherently flawed. I won't I won't get up on that soapbox, but. Um, you know, has that, has, is that chip now gone that, that you seem to you know, potentially have carried about that? Yeah, I, I actually wear it as a badge of honor, you know, and, and look, this is not to uh, uh, slight uh, going to college. I think education is important. And, you know, it's not that I haven't done my schooling now late in life. And, and um, you know, I seek knowledge and I love learning and learning about new things, but I wear this as a badge of honor. You know, it was a grind and a struggle. And, no story is really good and, and no success is really worth it unless there's a grind or a struggle that comes with it. And there certainly was in my life. And I received an education in a variety of different ways from a variety of different people. You just need to be in tune to all of that. You know, it may not be the conventional path and, and I don't disrespect any path that anybody uh, takes to get to their success. But um, for me, this was just how life uh, un rolled out for me, how it unfurled. That, that's how it happened. 
And as far as an insecurity about it, I'm actually extremely proud of it now. It's, it's fantastic for me and it's, it's given me a platform to speak on. It, it's what I speak on the most when I go up and I speak in front of people. And, um, you know, I want to inspire that, you know, no path is the same and any path you take, you know, it's going to take hard work and commitment. And as long as you have that and you are your true authentic self, you'll get to where you want to be. I love that. I love and it. This, Pete, honestly, it's why paying it forward is so important because when Tony and I first met, I think Tony saw me as, you know, some, you know, corporate guy. And um, yeah, I did. It really wasn't until he and I were sitting down one day and I was brave enough to say, well, you know, Tony, I'm a high school dropout, didn't go to college myself, did all these things. And it's funny on, on how my background and Tony's background parallel each other early in life. And yet here we are in very senior level positions for, for large organizations. And to Tony's point, once you're comfortable with being just your authentic self, you realize that this is still the land of opportunity. And as long as you're willing to do the work, you can educate yourself in many, many ways. And like you, I don't want to go on a, I don't want to get on an education soapbox. I'm not a huge fan of the way our education system is structured. But also to Tony's point, he and I have both gone back now for, for senior level, graduate level degrees over and above anything that we did, but we did it now because it's something we wanted to do, not something we felt like we had to take a path to get to somewhere. And that's, that's what's so lost usually. And um, when kids are coming out of high school at 17, 18 years old, making you know, life altering decisions about, you know, that, may, that involve a lot of money and, you know, a lot of debt potentially when, you know, they're, they're not necessarily qualified to, to know what they want to do, what they want to invest their time and effort and throw themselves into, because that's, that's, I think what you guys uh, would agree from our previous conversations, you have to believe in what you're doing. You have to wake up excited to do it in Absolutely. order to be the best version of yourself at it. And that, and you know, you, you have to discover what that thing is that, that makes you excited, that, that makes you, um, you know, want to give your all. And, um, that's really hard to do at a young age, I think. It, it really is. And, and honestly, when you think back, you know, it, it is to your point, it's you're asking a 17 or 18 year old person to make, you know, what do you want to be 20 years, 30 years later in life? And, you know, the reality is when I was 17, 18, 19 years old, I actually believed I knew everything about the world, right? <laughs> I was dumb know. enough to think I knew everything. Now I'm smart enough to realize how dumb I really was. And, and so I think, you know, we kind of live those things backwards a little bit at times. I, you know, I shared with you guys right before we started recording uh, that I discovered the world of uh, content marketing, inbound marketing, digital marketing just a few years ago. And for the first 13 years of Four Corner Resources, I used to describe our website as embarrassing, something that, you know, nobody should look at. Why, what what I, I would say things like, it's a staffing business. How many words can you use to describe it, right? So our website was five pages. Our website now is around 3,000 pages because I learned, I learned, I evolved, I, I grew, I changed. I, I discovered something that I didn't even know existed. And I look back and feel somewhat embarrassed. Uh, well, not too embarrassed since I'm saying this openly, but it does make me cringe a little bit. On the other hand, I'm thankful for the opportunity to grow and evolve. And I pity, or I don't pity, but I feel sorry for people who think that they've arrived and, and know right. what there is to know, because I'm excited about all the things I haven't yet learned. Um, I think the second you think you've arrived is the second that you're going to stumble and fall. I mean, nobody, what's the arrival? Like, where did you arrive to? There's no really arrival. It is a, a constant and continuous journey it's a ride it's it's a it's a never-ending process of learning and and evolving as a human being look it's like i told you i graduated from rlf and i was just a fundamentally changed person and events took place in my life even from that point to where we are today that have fundamentally changed me even more and have evolved me even more and given me great enlightenment and greater understanding of of how to do this of how to do this um life career you know, the balance with family, love, um, friendship, all of those things. And you get lost in it. And, and that's the sad thing. People get lost in it because they think success is something monetary. 
or that there is a destination and there really isn't a destination. You know, it's, it's just a journey along the way and, and, and you find out more about yourself and you find out more about people and how you want to live as you go on. I've had a couple um, it, life experiences over the past few months, I'll just say with, with my family. And it's, it's, it's caused some, some new thoughts that I've had about you know, what, what is the goal of life, if you will. And it's a very personal, individual que- question to answer, of course. But what I started to realize is that the goal is to peak as late as you possibly can. You know, whatever it is you're doing, that should be the goal. And when I look forward on my life, a life without um, something to look forward to, a life without something new to learn um, and acquire, it, it would, would be depressing. And so that's the way I've been thinking about it a lot over the past few months is that I just want to experience and learn as much as I can until I can't anymore. And that moment hopefully coincides with, with, you know, the last breath I take right until yeah. then I'm going to yeah. keep trying to improve and grow. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, you just, Rich, you just, said you used it, to man. tell me, Rich, you used to say, uh, okay, so you get this manager position and then what's next after, next after that, it's a director, then yeah. a VP, then, then C level, you know, then what, when does it end? When's it enough? When's it over? Yeah, there, there's actually a really good book. Pete, um, gentleman's name is by his name is Sean Acor, and it's called uh, the Happiness Advantage. And really, what Tony's referring to is something that comes from that book. And um, what he talks about is that we have a tendency, highly driven, highly motivated people have a tendency to push their happiness beyond the cognitive horizon. Meaning, I'll be happy as soon as I get to this stage. Well, then you get to that stage, and then what's next? If I get good grades. I want better grades. If I get a good job, I want a better job. I got one title, I want the next title, right? And so we're always chasing this happiness instead of just truly understanding that happiness happens along that entire journey. It's not a destination. It is it is part of the overall experience. And you know, you said something about experience, right? I mean, it, it, to me, that's what life's about. It's about having these experiences, good and bad along the way, but appreciating the entire thing. You know, we have a tendency to believe that we are the center of the universe, but the reality is, I mean, I'm looking out my window now and I see, you know, 150, 200 cars driving down, you know, the road in front of me here. If tomorrow I'm gone, those 150, 200 cars are still going to be going up and down that road, right? And one guy's going to be mad because somebody else cut them off in traffic. The reality is we're here for a very short period of time and we're important to ourselves and to those that are close around us. But to everybody else, we're really insignificant in the overall universe. A hundred percent true. Yeah, for, for sure. Well, you you but so apply that if you can, because you know, Tony, you you said if you're if you're a manager, you want to go to a director. If you're a director, you want to be a VP. So as as leaders in business with the team, and and I, I want to be able to touch on this because I know it's something you guys take so seriously, the concept of team and culture at work. Um, and I, and I suspect you would take that seriously without RLF. It's just who you are. Um, right. you, you guys take a lot of pride in, in what you do and you expect you know, a lot from those around you as, as a person who's staffed for your teams before I can say that definitively, it's not always easy because, uh, it's rarely easy. In fact, um, because you have very high expectations as you should. So how do you what message do you, would you give to your employees who are ambitious yet need to be patient at the same time? How do you, how do you handle those conversations? You want to take that one, Tony? Well, the, you know, one of the things, there's nothing wrong with ambition and there's nothing wrong with wanting to move up. What you need to balance that with is what is your reason? What are your causes for that? What, what are you really driving at? Because if, if the goal is to move up in title for title's sake, I want to be a CIO one day, you know, or, um, you know, have that ambitions for ambition's sake. I need to show what a success I am. And this is my way of expressing that. Well, you know, I would argue that those might not be the best reasons in the world. A good, healthy ambition is fantastic. And, and uh, moving up in position so that you're able to do more and influence more is fantastic. You just need to make sure that your priorities and your reasoning for all that is in line. And, you know, you, you said it in the question, Pete, it, it's really all about patience. 
One thing that I can tell you um, in, in my story and my background is I, I never really, you know, hunted for that big promotion. I never really asked for that. Hey, I, I you know, when can I be a VP? And I'm not saying that that's a bad thing to do. But I, I, you've got to let your work and you've got to let your yourself, your humanity, uh, your your desire to do what's best and what's right for the people around you and the company and 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 you know the customers that you service. If you service customers, you got to do what's right. And as long as you have those priorities straight and realize that you're working for your family and you're working, you know, there's means to an end. Um, it'll come. It's a byproduct, you know, you, you just got to put in the work and you got to put in the effort. Ambition's great. Does it, the desire to move up is great. You just got to make sure that your priorities and the reasons behind that are in tune and in line with who you are at your core self. Yeah, and, and I think for me, you know, I'm a, I'm a pretty big Daniel Pink fan, fan from the standpoint of, you know, autonomy, mastery, and purpose, right? And I focus a lot on that purpose aspect. When I'm looking at anyone coming in the door, I can teach them the mastery skills. I can give them the autonomy to get their work done. I can even help them define their purpose. But what I really focus on more than anything is what is their purpose? What is my purpose? And for me, you know, I go back for myself, you know, I grew up in, in a military family and my father, anytime we would go camping, he always made sure that we left the campground better than what we found it. Now I've translated that into myself and to my, my, my leadership style that my entire goal is to leave every place I go into better than what I found it. And when, when I think about the, the concept of, of team, right, it really is helping people understand what their purpose is. I love diversity in people. I love diversity in cultures. I love diversity in, in almost every aspect. What I don't like diversity in is in values. I look at people from what are their core values? If you can find people that have like type values who, who are just genuinely want to be better or want to make things better, then the diversity of their backgrounds, their culture, their race, color, religion, all the things that go along with it actually make a much, much better product because they're all in it for the same reason, but they're bringing their own flavor to that. And, and for me, when you can do that, when you can empower a group of people who are otherwise diverse to do very you know unique things together, the bond that they get and the things that they will accomplish, you, you, you can't even begin to put a measurement tool next to it. It's, it's, it's really unfathomable what they'll be able to do. You know, Pete, I'll tell you too, uh, to piggyback on that and, and, and to circle back around to the original question, I, I've personally witnessed individuals, uh, very, very talented, very innovative, innovative individuals, um, you know, perform at a certain level, but then somewhere along the way, their priorities change to how can I move up and get that promotion? How can I get that big bonus or that big raise? Or I want to be at this uh, C level position. And I've seen people completely sabotage their careers unknowingly only because the reason behind it may have been ego, who knows what it is, but the reason they were performing was solely for that movement upward. And it's got to mean more than that. How do you, as an IT, as leaders in an IT organization, it, that the conversations that I know you guys have with your team has to surprise a lot of people because they're conversations that, that they're not used to being involved in. <laughs> I know that to be, to be true. Um, how much time would you, you know, do you think you spend investing in the person versus investing uh, in, or the, you know, not just the person, but the people versus investing in the project that needs to be done, the next upgrade, the next implementation, how, how would you say your time is balanced? I'll say I spend as much time as it takes because there's no better investment than in people, right? And I'll take that a step further. When I talk, when, when people ask me like, what are some, what are the greatest things you've accomplished in your career? And, and Pete, you know a little bit about my background, but when it comes to technology, I've done some really cool stuff. I mean, I've done some really cool stuff. Yep. And in those companies that I did that really cool stuff, it's been replaced five, six, seven times 
The people that I did that work with have gone on to other companies. There's no resemblance of what anything that I've done anywhere over my career that is still valid today. In my mind, the memories are there. But when I really think about the things that I've done that I consider to be my greatest accomplishments, it is creating good teams of people, great teams of people. And, you know, there's a, there's a, a phrase that says something to the neighborhood of relationships transcend transactions, right? And there's a reason that you and I are sitting here today having this conversation. To your point, we've known each other since the day you started Four Corners, right? Yes. And, and, and that was, that's not by happenstance that we're still together. It's because those relationships have transcended transactions. And to me, at the end of the day, it always comes down to how are you going to connect with somebody to help them grow beyond where they are, even if that means growing outside of your organization. I think we always look at turnover in an organization as a bad thing, right? Leaders are graded on the percentage of turnover they have or don't have. And to me, why would you not want to help someone be successful, even if it meant that opportunity for them was outside of your organization? No, it's so true. And I think creating the environment where people believe that is the challenge. And, and I'll tell you, just by happenstance, I had a conversation with our internal team last week where I said, hey, look, it, it, look the great resignation has, has been going on for, for the past year. We've seen what I consider to be some pretty unnatural acts with hiring uh, because of the very tight labor market and you know, all these companies have been spiking and they're hiring. And now that's starting to, we're starting to see that go in the opposite direction. That's a different conversation, but we've seen more turnover over the past year, just across the board than we would see under normal circumstances. And I said to my team, if, if, if you don't want to be part of our organization internally, by all means, I get it. And I would be hypocritical to say otherwise. I've resigned from every job but the one I'm in now. There you go, so, right? It, but so come and talk to us. Yeah, maybe we can help. Maybe we can't, right? If you, say, if you want to say, hey, look, I really want to go save whales. We don't have that option available on our staff. But if it's something reasonable, if it's a work situation, if it's, if it's something that we can impact, we want to try. But at the very least, if we can't, we'd like to help you find your next job. Right. We're not going to be in and, and to leave to, to have that environment would be incredibly powerful. And I can tell you, I don't believe I've been able to create that because that is um, much easier said than done for for an employee, specifically sure. for a, you know, a newer employee, a younger professional to take that leap of faith and say, hey, Rich, hey, Tony, or in my case, hey, Pete, listen, I appreciate the opportunity, but this isn't really where I want to be. What advice do you have? But I can tell you that I would love, I don't want those conversations, but I would love the fact that they could happen if, yeah, if they know, happen. I, and, and it sounds like you guys may have found, found some keys to that. Well, I, I, my first exposure to that w was with Rich, and, and it, it was shocking for me. I've never seen anything like that where, you know, we had a performer. And that performer had an opportunity elsewhere. And um, Rich understood it was a viable, really good opportunity. And Rich went all out to assist the person in exiting the company and moving on to their future endeavor. And I'd never seen anything like that. I'm like, whoa, wait, you're not going to fight for this guy? You're not going to, you know, and he's like, no, why would I do that? This is going to be better for him, better for his family, better for his life. And that was absolutely shocking for me because here I am later on in my career and I've never been exposed to leadership like that. And, you know, you talk about leadership, Pete, what is the definition of that's leadership, you know, and, and it went far beyond the realm of staying in the company. It went outside of the company. It, it, it went to a level where you're leading somebody in life. And that's so much more meaningful than within the four walls, you know, Absolutely. And that was, you know, one of my first exposures to that. And it was a, a very surprised moment. And now, you know, I carry more of that mentality and more of that attitude. And, and um, I try to understand the hopes and dreams and families of all the people that I get to lead, you know, and, and, and I think that's equally as important as to make sure that you take the time 
to really know who you're spending all day with. Cause you got to think about it. We're here, we're spending this time with these individuals. Well, who are they really? What are their dreams? What's the movie background of their story? You know, what book could they write? You know, and, and when you start looking at things in that way, you make much more of an investment in human beings, thus becoming a better leader than you ever have been. And you don't even know you're doing it. Well, and the other side of that coin is, is, is as well, you know, to Tony's point, and, and I won't get into specific numbers, but what I'll say is in an organization where we've had, I'll, I'll say lower double digit turnover as, a, as, a, as an organization, voluntary turnover because of the great resignation, inside of IT, we are in the very low single digits in a market, and you know, Pete, that turnover in the IT market right now is astronomical. So when people know that you care and they know that you're here for them, it's hard for them to be swayed by, by little promises or little things of the unknown when they know what they have here. And, and it's not, it's, it goes far beyond the organization. It, it's what they have in each other, what they have in their leadership and what they have from the organization as well. And you, know, you guys have, have created that environment. You work at it. It doesn't happen by accident. It, you know, that, 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 that we know. Do you hire do you screen for that in your hiring process? Do you believe that you can tell, you know, how likely someone is to buy in, you know, when you're interviewing? So you know, forget the skill set, forget the the experience. You know, they can do the job. We don't know, but based on, because we, we know that we can be surprised by that, but, um, but everything looks good, except you're not sure whether they're going to fit into the culture or, or yeah. do you think you've figured out how to screen for that? Well, I don't, I don't know if you can ever get it exact, right? I don't think there's, a, there's, there's no matrix out there that says if they answer the que this question this way and that question this way, then they're, you know, 70% more likely to stick. Um, I think it really comes down to that, who is that person? And, and for me, honestly, when somebody comes in to meet with me, I, I appreciate a good resume, but the reality is I throw it to the side because one, we can all hire somebody that creates a resume for us, right? But at the end of the day, I expect that my team is going to, to, to make sure their tech skills are where they are. And if they're not, I can hire those tech skills from just about any vendor out there that I need. What I can't hire is someone who cares. And so I spend a lot more time on just getting to know who they are and their thought process behind things. And I'll tell you, frankly, from a candidate's perspective, they don't always open up because they've heard it all before, right? Right. Who doesn't in an interview sell their culture and, and things like that? So they're hearing the same things from us. When Once they're in the door, if we believe we have a fit, once they're in the door, not only do they, I, I guess what I'm saying is our actions meet our words, right? And, and I think that's where we probably differentiate ourselves. And through my career, that's where I've probably differentiated myself as a leader than probably most other organizations. I, I love, you know, I, I don't want to say we've got this down to a science, Pete. I don't think anybody will ever have it down to a science. One thing I can tell you is I enjoy a good interview. And the reason I do is because, you know, usually nowadays interviews happen in a panel format. And I love being part of that because there'll be a rapid fire of skill questions. Hey, have you done this? Do you know that? And one of my favorite things to do in an interview is completely shift gears and just get into conversational mode. I stop asking questions and I love getting into a conversation with a candidate. And, you know, uh, we, we hired a QA manager not too long ago and there was the rapid fire skill questions and you can see him perked up and a little tight and he's, you know, he's hitting these questions. And then he came to me and I shifted gears completely and I just got into a conversation about what his interests are, what he likes to do, who cares about work, man. Let's not talk about work right now. I don't even care about it right now either. And uh, we and you just see that candidate just the 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 they they just relax and the guard comes down and you start getting a little more you know a little more insight and a little more information. By the time they're in, Pete, the one thing I can tell you is is these people somehow Rich and I have been able to bring the real caring type because these people care so much. I swear Rich and I have to go out of our way to say, hey, stop caring so much, go home. Right? Go, home. Yeah, go home. You don't need to be here. You know, you don't need to work that extra weekend. And these people will do it naturally. And there's something to be said about just that human quality, getting away from 
that real corporate look and feel and, and, and jargon and just being a regular person. Somebody wants to go all out for that regular person, that person that they feel they, that cares about them, cares about their family and their well-being. And, you know, Rich and I have seen results in just being plain old regular people. It's, it's unique guys. I think, you know, that it's, 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 um, it's rare. And yeah, the people who get to be on your team are very fortunate as a result of that. Um, and so it's really a pleasure to hear you guys talk about just that caring aspect of it, because it's not lip service. It's not, you know, I hear the word culture a lot you know, these days and have for years. And half the time, I don't even know what it means. Most of the time, I don't even know what it means. Like, what, what, what is it? But I think the tone you guys set and the, and the examples that, um, that, that you, the example that you set is, is where your culture comes from. And it's, uh, it's really neat to, to hear in action. Um, and while RLF has been a big part of your lives, um, you know, that's not where everything ends. Uh, and I know you guys are looking to kind of take this message forward. So talk, talk a little bit about that. We, what have, how do you apply, how are you applying what you've learned, um, to others so you can pay it forward perhaps beyond yeah, I, your, your current staff? That's a, that's a great question because the reality is, is that when you look at a program like RLF to your point, it's not inexpensive. Um, I'll argue that the value that you get out of it is far more than you invest in it, but it is an investment in, in people. And so they are very selective about who they, you know, who companies are typically select about who they send and things of that nature. And it's kind of a shame because there's not a single person, whether it's inside the corporate walls or outside that could not benefit from this program, right? So Tony and I have kind of come up with our own rendition of it. It's a, it's a skinny down version. It's a corporate appropriate version. It doesn't focus so much on the emotional aspects of things. Um, but I, I got to tell you that, you know, we've, we've created uh, a program that we call Pathways for Life. And we have, we're basically on almost our last session of our first cohort for this year. And it's amazing the results that we've seen from this program. Even though we've kind of skinnied down some of the more direct emotional things, the speakers that we have coming in talking about crucial conversations, talking about um, emotional intelligence, talking about their life experiences and things of that nature, the books, the programs, the, the bond that we're seeing from that group of people is, again, second to none. And when you have people that are coming to you saying, these are things that are changing my life and not just changing my life, but they're changing the lives of myself, my family, my friends. I'm taking these nuggets home and I'm helping. And, and you know, I had a crucial conversation with someone about these things. And, you know, before I would have handled it like this, but after this, I'm handling it like this. And it was so productive. Like that's when, you know, like you're doing something special when, when people are, are, are really feeling that sort of connectivity to the things that you're providing them, that to me is where leadership comes into place. It is really providing people with the opportunity to be successful. Successful can be figurative, but ultimately it boils down to how do I help this person achieve their goals, whether it's inside of here or outside? How do I make this place better than I found it? And really, and really it's, it's, it's trying to capture that, that spirit of what RLF was about, that spirit of figuring out who you are as a human being and, and what it takes to get to that level and bottle it up and be able to say, here, let me share this with you. And, and I really echo what Rich is saying. Anybody, anybody, and I don't care what walk of life you come from and you know what social status or anything that may be out there that categorizes people, I don't care where you're from. This is a, a benefit to everybody and everybody should be should have an opportunity at this and that's pretty pretty much what rich and i want to do and just this one session you know this 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 six month session that we've had with this group of people if it all ended pete if it all ended just now i would feel fulfilled because already what we've been seeing out there and just the improvement in some of the people's lives i mean uh, you know it, you know, what's most meaningful to me, I'll, I'll tell you really quick is, you know, we did do a section on crucial conversations and how important it is to, to really approach that the right way and have the, uh, 
uh, right self-awareness to approach things. And somebody came back and she said, you know what, I, I got to thank you guys because it truly improved my relationship with my daughter. Wow. You know, we weren't having a good one. And, and now we're going out together and things at home have improved. You know, it wasn't a career conversation. It wasn't her moving up or anything like that. But to hear how this program contributed to an improvement of someone's home life, that was just huge. Yeah, it's, it, it's these things are tied together, right? You can't separate them. And, and we can talk about right. work-life balance all, you know, all day long, but if, if, you're, if your personal life is a mess, if your health is, is, is in jeopardy, if you're, if you're worried, you're struggling, discontent, whatever that might be, it is going to affect your job. It is 100%. going to affect your mood yep. and, and, and you can't separate them. But, well, you can, right? But you have to be very conscious of that and you have to make a big effort and you have to understand where it's coming from and all of the things that you guys are talking about. Um, you know, it's so much easier said than done. And yeah. I don't think we, most of us can arrive there on our own without some outside help. Right, it always takes help. And, you know, uh, Pete, I look forward to you and, and other people that we've worked with in the past, seeing this program evolve and get formalized between uh, Rich and myself. And we're really gonna try to take it out to as many people and as many walks of life as possible and see, you know, it, 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 Rich and I talk about it all the time and it's corny, it's very corny, uh, but it is the reality that if we can, you know, contribute to society in a very, very positive way and make a living all while doing that. Isn't that the dream? I mean, isn't that living Absolutely. the dream, you know, isn't that what the journey is all about? Uh, so, so look forward to you seeing this get formalized and start picking up momentum. Well, I, 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 I who is it for? And I say that with a caveat, it, this is a little thing between Rich and I, uh, that I asked him a few years ago, I, if, if, if someone we both know should go, to RLF and he said no, and he had to give me a reason why. So I, I don't want to assume that anyone could benefit. So who, who's it intended for? Who would get the most yeah, out that, of it? I will tell you, Pete, the difference here is that this one really is geared towards anyone. Tony, Tony said it, from any walk of life, any educational background, any, any uh, level of career, whether it's beginning, entry, mid or senior level career. So um, there, there's something for everyone in this. So Pathways for Life, have you, is the trademark in progress yet? Yeah, <laughs> it is actually. It, is. It, should be, it should be if it's not already. Yeah. Uh, I'll just say, and this isn't because you guys came on today. In fact, I didn't even know of this until until we got on today. Right. But I'm genuinely excited in, in to hear what you're doing because I know firsthand the impact that RLF had on, on, on you guys. So, you know, at times I've thought, this is something I need to do because when you, know, you, you see someone go to, you know, take a class, have a new experience and it lasts for a period of time. This is persisting. This isn't going away. This is, this is like a, um, you know, uh, you know, it's tattooed on you now and it's just part of who you are. And so for, for you guys who have um, gotten so much out of it to be able to package it up in a different way, take what you've learned as you know, there as well as your life experiences, which are diverse and, and rich and deep to then give that I, the world's going to be a better place for it. And that's a pretty rare thing to be able to say in and of itself. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy for everyone who's going to be exposed to this because, um, you know, their, their lives are going to improve a lot. So really cool Absolutely. stuff. And you know, yeah, but I gotta tell you, I mean, honestly, I think it's it's ours that that improves the most, Pete. Because again, when when you're impacting people at that level, I mean, there's again, you know, being you know, being an employer yourself, it's great that you can provide opportunity and career growth and and financial uh, pay for for people to be successful. And those are all very very good things. They're much needed. But when you get somebody that comes up to you and talks about how you've changed their life because of a program that you've put together. It, it hits differently. It, it, it's, yeah. it's really a special feeling. And, and yeah, and, you know, even speaking from a selfish perspective, it just feels good. It, it just feels good. And, you know, Pete, after RLF, you stumble and you fall at times. The difference is, is you know how to pick yourself up. You know how to move forward, you know, and, and uh, I, I think uh, you exercise it, you keep it in practice, and then eventually it's just muscle memory 
and it's ingrained and, and, and you move forward. But to Rich's point, as we, as we go on this journey and, and, and put this program together that we have, um, I'm learning more and more every day from the individuals that we get to talk to. I get emotional, I get choked up and we try to not get too deep into the emotion part of things, but it's so funny how it happens all by itself. Naturally, yep. it, it just happens naturally and you cannot help but to get pulled right into it. And um, it's a special feeling. It's a, it's a really, really amazing thing to watch and experience. I'm so happy for all this. I, I really am. This is so cool, guys. And I think that's a perfect way to end because I don't think we can get better than where we are right now with this. Uh, but the last question I want to ask is, where, where can someone find out more information on it? Or are you not ready for there yet? Because whatever you have, we're going to put it in our show notes for sure. We're not quite ready for that yet. Give us, give us, we, will, we will put some addendums together for you here shortly. Perfect. Well, stay tuned and, and we'll be sure to, to promote it when you guys are ready. So Rich, Tony, thank you so much for investing your time in this today. I, I personally appreciate it professionally and, and honored to have you guys on as well. So uh, just thank you. It's been thank a long you. time in the making, Pete. We thank you for everything as well. Thank you for Absolutely. the friendship over the years. Awesome. All right. Well, guys, if you've been listening this far, we can't thank you enough. As always, I love feedback. I want to hear topics, questions, suggestions for, for other shows. Email us anytime, hirecalling at fourcornerresources.com. And thank you and have a great rest of your day.